Dear students, dear colleagues, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is a real great and fantastic pleasure for me to be here. Uh, and, um, and here I not only mean now and today, but also in Padova. I've been here since October and will stay until January. Uh, January, I'm a visiting professor at Scuola Galileana. So, um, and it is not very often that I have the chance to speak uh, in a room in a building where the building is named after me. <laughs> so Bo is an old Swedish uh, first name and it so happens that this is Palazzo del Bo, which is fantastic. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can see nature and how do we experience nature and I will uh, very soon focus on the specialities uh, that I do and the main reason why I am here in Padova and why I have visited Padova for several times. Uh, it's here where world leading research is going on in the field that I'm very interested in and that is a field where you might say that we are approaching a shift of paradigm, a new way, a new era of observing nature around us and that includes everything from say the human body to uh, uh, very far galaxies. Um, we have always studied nature, we have looked at nature, we have used the sight, we have felt it, we can hear, we can smell and so on. So we use always our senses to understand what's going on around us. Now, uh, soon uh, it was realized that it would be better to have some kind of instruments. And for instance, uh, Tycho Brahe had his instruments uh, in Uranienborg on the island of Wien between Sweden and Dan Denmark. But he didn't have any telescope. It was here, as you all know, about 402 years ago, that uh, Galileo made his first observations of the moons around Jupiter, opening for a completely new way of looking at nature and also, I may say, uh, creating modern man and the modern society, where you can rely on your own senses, your own logical capability and your cognitive processes in your brain. And by systemat making a systematic study of nature, uh, we started to lay the foundation for understanding the laws and principles that govern uh, the whole universe. There are laws of nature, as you all know, and those are based on the fact that you can make exact uh, and very precise measurements and you can repeat them and systematically. The most common uh, sense, I would say, the most powerful sense in a way, is our eyes. We can see things. Um, and the eye can see two things, essentially. As you know, we can see intensity or the strength of light. We, f we can see when it's dark and we can see when it's bright. Uh, but we also can see color. Now, intensity, uh, strength, uh, is what we physicists call uh, amplitude. So, uh, if we look at the, the spectrum of light, uh, we see that the spectrum is in the middle there where you have the word visible. I should have a pointer, but never mind. Uh, in the middle of the scale, you see something visible, uh, uh, and that is where we can see with our eyes. Our eyes are some kind of radio receivers, but for a very limited frequency range, very limited uh, wavelength range. And we can only see amplitude, the strength, as up in the right hand, and wavelength, which is color. But you see, light and electromagnetic radiation, which extends all the way from long wave radio at the left-hand side to gamma rays on the extreme right-hand side, uh, all this light has many properties. Uh, until recently, until 40 years ago, we thought that they had 10 different properties, not only those two that I mentioned, the amplitude and the wavelength. Uh, we thought they had 10, now we know they have at least 23, perhaps even as many as 104, if the mathematicians are right. Because by studying the laws of nature that uh, govern, that rule the electromagnetic radiations, the so-called Maxwell's equations, which were written down by another intellectual giant, uh, James Clark Maxwell, about 150 years ago, who was from Scotland, uh, almost on the same level as Galileo, I may say. Uh, one of the really big physicists uh, in the world, together with Galileo, Isaac Newton, uh, Einstein, and a few others. 
So this electromagnetic radiation has then been studied, and about 80 years ago, we discovered, or the scientists discovered, that from the sky, from the universe, we do not only receive light, that is radio emissions, if I may call them so, in this narrow band of frequencies in the middle of the scale here, but also long wavelength uh, radiation, which we cannot see with our eyes, which is called radio. By the way, um, we can see, if you remember, we see light with our eyes, as I mentioned, but we can also detect uh, other wavelengths, actually. And this is something which I mention to my students whenever I can, because, you know, in, on a cold day when we go near the fire, we can feel the warmth, the heat from the fire, and that is also radiation, but it is not visible. We cannot see it with our eyes, but we can feel it with our hands. And that's called infrared radiation, which is another kind of electromagnetic radiation. And so that's to the uh, lower side of light. And on the upper side of light, we have ultraviolet radiation. And you know, in the summer, we get brown, we get suntan. So our bodies are sensitive to ultraviolet, but that's not a very good detector. If you want to study the, the, the variation of the sun, it's not a very good idea to go out on the beach and get a suntan. So we need better instruments to study the sun and we need even wider frequency range. And with, in these frequency ranges, we also need these telescopes. We have, uh, we have been uh, copying or uh, modifying or improving the uh, concept of telescope which was invented uh, by Galileo to a fantastic degree. But very, very, for a very, very long time, we have been looking only mainly at uh, get, uh, being able to detect more wavelengths with our telescope than our eyes can detect, and uh, smaller amplitudes, weaker signals than our eyes can detect. Because somehow we have been limited by the fact that the eye can only see those two qualities. But there are more qualities. And I also like to mention uh, Giambattista Odierna, who, who uh, discovered uh, the microscope, or L'Occhio della Mosca, I think it's called in, in Italian, 1644. So, light also and radio also have uh, polarization. And most of you are familiar with the left-hand instrument, because we need instruments to see polarization. We cannot see polarization with our eyes. Some of us can see it a little bit. For instance, I can do it, and some of you may do it too, but it's very, very weak. Many insects can see polarization very clearly and use that for orientation. But usually we need uh, Polaroid glasses to be able to utilize the polarization or to block it out. So that's one uh, instrument, if you, may, so if you may accept that explanation, that word for observing polarized light. But we also have TV, TV transmission, transmitters, uh, they transmit TV programs and the, the wavelength band is getting full. So a way to avoid uh, or to try to utilize the wavelength region uh, more efficiently, we sometimes very often transmit with, uh, with horizontal polarization. That is when the antenna elements are located in this way, but we also uh, used vertical polarization, as you see on the left-hand TV mast, the right-hand topmost antenna is actually in this direction. That is uh, uh, vertical polarization. And these two are, as we say, orthogonal to each other, so they do not interf interfere. So you can send one TV program on one channel on this polarization, another TV program on this polarization. And to illustrate this, I need the help of Anna Sponselli, who is a graduate student, uh, who promised to help me to uh, play around with these little footballs. I guess I should have had David Beck Beckham or Zlatan Ibrahimovic here, but uh, I mean, this is more physics than football. So what happens is, if I have an electric charge, let's say this is charged electrically, like a very, very big electron. If I do like this with this electron, then a little time after, this electron will also oscillate over there. This is my transmitting antenna, and that is the receiving antenna. So this is now how I transmit horizontally polarized radio waves from me to Anna. And if Anna do that, she transmits to me. Now if I do this, we also receive, and that is the vertical polarization of the TV antenna. Electron moving, or electrons in, moving like this in my antenna, will soon enough uh, 
set electrons in that antenna into motion. So that, was, that is in principle what we can do and what we do today, what we use today in radio astronomy, radio communication, radar in uh, wireless networks and so on. But um, about 30 years ago it was discovered and it was possible, uh, and this is also an example of a, a telescope. Uh, this is a telescope which uh, works at 21 cent centimeter wavelengths to show that the optical telescope can also be the technique of optical telescope can be used in radio. About 20 years ago, 25 years ago, or almost 30 years ago actually, it was found that not only this and this motion can be generated and transmitted with light. That was the research which was done with lasers, laser light. But also if I do like this, which is changing the spin of this football, it can transmit over there, and if I also do like this, which is changing the orbital state of this football, you get that. This is called spin angular momentum, or as we call polarization. It is actually the same as the polarization, whereas this thing is completely new. And then when we try to um, convince the funding agencies uh, in Sweden and Europe, well, we want to study this because we know that if we do this, something happens over there. Now, the polarization can only be this or this, two states, horizontal or vertical, two states. Whereas this can actually rotate one complete revolution per wavelength or two per wavelength or this way and this way or per period if you like. So there are actually an infinite number of ways you can have orbital of a, of a football which are uh, unique to, to this state and the same with uh, the, uh, an electron or an atom or something and the radiation that is transmitted looks a little bit like uh, on this uh, picture here. Um, so, thank you. Uh, now, <laughs> actually, here we have solved the so-called Maxwell's equation, the laws of nature that determine how electromagnetic radiation behaves. On the left-hand side, you see, if you look very carefully, you see there are little arrows, and each of the arrow is rotating around its own axis. So each, each little arrow is rotating like this, it's spinning, so that's the spinning of the light, or as we say, photons, because every wave has a particle, every particle has a wave, this is what quantum mechanics teaches us. So it, it rotates like, like this, but also you can see that it moves in a spiral fashion. It's just like when you uh, water your lawn in the, um, in the garden in the summer, or whenever you do it, even in the winter here perhaps, no. But uh, at least in, in, when it, in the summer, if you do like this with the water, you know you have this spiral motion. And that is a pattern that can be recognized and can be used for transmission. And actually here, the red figure is a, a description or a plot or a graphical illustration of how this uh, quantity, this observable, that we cannot imagine because we cannot see it with our eyes. We have no idea of it. We can only solve it mathematically and make a sort of artificial picture of it. But it exists, it is in this room, but we have never used it, and now we are beginning to, to use it. And to show you that this really works also in a very basic way, let me uh, show you two films. This is a film where one shines laser light on a small particle, which is an order of three micrometers. And this laser light has this spin motion, so the, the photons of the, of the um, laser light rotates, rotate, 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 all of them rotate together and when they meet this particle, that particle starts to rotate, of course, right? So this is now a confirmation that this spin motion of this invisible light can actually get something mechanical particle moving. And what's even more interesting, if the light has this orbital momentum, the particle starts to orbit just like the, the Earth orbits around the Sun. So we can transfer spin angular momentum, the spin on the left hand side and orbit on the right hand side. So it really works in a physical way. Now it was soon discovered or, or uh, understood that this can be used for things like radio communication. And here is a quote by Professor Zeininger in Vienna where we actually visited on Friday. Uh, and um, he said, if you look down there, 
the different color, the sort of yellow color, an individual photon, each little particle of light, can carry much more than a single bit, and a bit is what the bit we have in information on computers. So you can have in a, a single uh, pulse of light, you can have many, many, many bits. You can actually transfer the, whole, transfer the whole alphabet with it. And this is what we are trying to do right now, even here in uh, Padua. And um, in order to test this, we made an experiment in Uppsala about a year ago. Uh, when I had my Italian friends visiting me, and it was the coldest winter in Uppsala since 1752. So now they think that we are, you know, minus 25 and one meter snow all winter along, but that's not the case. So if you come to Sweden, don't be afraid. But this is what we did in an antenna chamber. So we had a reflector which looked a little bit, bit strange on the right hand side, and then we sent uh, electromagnetic radiation from an ordinary antenna that you use for Wi Fi for wireless communication for your computer and we got the reflected light and the reflected light did indeed contain this. This is now being published in a scientific article. Now in, on June 24th, which is precisely uh, uh, halfway from Christmas, yeah, half a year from Christmas, so this is also a big holiday in Sweden, but usually you spend your time with the family, but we went down here and we made an experiment in uh, Venice where we transmitted from San Giorgio, the, the little lighthouse there, T, to Palazzo Ducale across the, the canal there, about 400 meters, 442 meters, and we show that you can transmit this and this also over very long distances at this radio frequency used for Wi-Fi, the thing that we have for our wireless network. And here, is we also not did we only not did we only show that you can transmit simple radio but even whole tv programs so here is an example where we have transmitting an the tv program without just using this quantity the linear polarization and here is Electra who's sitting over there finishing her phd thesis now and anna who helped me now they ran the experiment and now soon you should see a different tv picture and here you see that TV channel is produced with this uh, degree of freedom, this quality of light. And it is the same frequency at the same time without occupying any extra frequency space. So we managed to pack two TV channels on one and the same uh, frequency uh, bandwidth as normally for one TV channel. And you can multiply that by 2468 or 248 actually. And the only difference is that one TV channel was transmitted with this and the other one with this. And they are independent of each other. And this is, you know, the, uh, the, what you call a loggia, the Palazzo Ducale. So we spent a whole week there. It was quite fantastic, I must say. Um, now, what can you use this for? Well, you, one thing we want to use it for is to study the sun, because the sun has all kinds of vortici, vortices and, and so. But the most extreme case of what we want to do is to study black holes, because it turns out if you have a rotating black hole, like the one we suspect exists in the middle of our galaxy, the Milky Way, uh, near the uh, uh, Sagittarius uh, constellation, uh, it's called Sagittarius A star, then we have found by numerical computer experiments that the light from this uh, sur the surrounding of this black, uh, this black hole should actually look like this. Again, this this quality. So, there is where we are now, and this is where we are continuing our, um, our research. And uh, before I end, I'd like to make another little toy experiment. Thank you. So, I need that, that bag over there. Uh, you, will, you will not be able to see this, most of you, but this is, you know, a spinning top. You remember from your childhood you're spinning it, so it spins. Right? So if I twist it around, it will spin around its own axis. But if you remember that sometimes it moves around in this way, on the table or on the floor, this is the spin degree of freedom, this is the spin, this is the orbit. But also, sometimes the axis of this uh, little spinning top rotates like this. This is called rotation, this is called precession in physics terms. And the, even the precession can actually oscillate and move in a periodic way. Namely, it can wiggle like this, and this is called mutation. And every oscillatory 
quantity that you can produce with an electron or something which behaves like this will actually be able to carry information. So this is the next step. There, there's a whole lot of new ideas and we are working very hard on getting this into practical use, both for science and for uh, technology. So the future is really fantastic and I'm really happy to be here and I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.